Okay, so today we're going to be discussing the anti-biblical position of the Pope. One of the most powerful men on earth holds a position that has existed for nearly 2,000 years. As the world changes and faith evolves, his authority remains. What began with one apostle has become 1.2 billion followers under one man. He is the head of the Catholic Church, the Pope. many famous Catholics out there, more than likely, if you hear that someone in Hollywood is a Christian, they're probably Catholic. And all of them so greatly admire and look up to the Pope. Now, first of all, what's the meaning of this title, Pope? Latin, Papa, from Greek, Papas, Father. The title, since about the ninth century of the Bishop of Rome, the head of the Roman Catholic Church. Just within this very definition of Pope, there are a couple of different heresies. First of all, Father. Now, we all know what Jesus said about applying this title to anyone outside of your earthly father, because in Scripture it does say, Honor thy father and thy mother. But this is like a title like teacher, rabbi, and all of these. Jesus said, Call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. But also, it's the Pope. So, uh, you know, for Catholics, it's a huge deal. Yeah. And did you get to meet him? Did you talk I to did. him? I did. I met the Holy Father, and he had no idea who I was. Yeah. And Christians for hundreds of years have denounced the Pope for taking on the title of Holy Father. Edmund Beck, back in the 1500s, here is the Bishop of Rome declared a plain antichrist, and that he would be called the Most Holy Father, and that all Christian men should acknowledge him for no less than their spiritual father, notwithstanding these plain words of Christ. But now let's examine the other title, the head of the Roman Catholic Church, he is called. Every Catholic establishment views the Pope as the head of their church, just as at the Walpole Catholic website, and I quote, as vicar of Jesus Christ, the Pope governs the Catholic Church as its supreme head. The Pope, as Bishop of Rome, is the chief pastor and shepherd of the whole church. And such titles are given over and over again within the Catholic catechisms, which is their doctrinal basis for what they believe. The Roman pontiff, head of the College of Bishops, enjoys his infallibility in virtue of his office, and so on and so on. But we Christians know without a shadow of a doubt who is the head of the church, and Christ is the head of the body, that is, the church. Now, as most of you already know, the Catholics, they say that the very first pope was that of Simon Peter. And according to Catholic tradition, that of Linus was the second bishop after St. Peter. The same Linus is mentioned by Paul in his epistle to Timothy. So they're claiming that these popes have always existed. Such is not true. Now, over the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to be showing excerpts from a documentary detailing the history of how the Pope position came to be. We tend to think about Christianity as being all these basilicas around the world. But before that, what you had were basically house churches. And if you had a series of small house churches, you needed somebody to be over that. Christians were trying to set up an organized community so that people would recognize who the members of that church were. A kind of hierarchy, sort of modeled on the Roman army. Bishop of means the most senior churchman in that particular city. Because Rome is the capital and the center of the empire, the Bishop of Rome becomes the leader of the other bishops, a position that will eventually become known as Pope. Constantine was a great military commander, and when it was his turn to become a junior emperor, he decided to fight his competition. Constantine, the pagan commander of Rome's western army, declares war on the commander of the east to decide who will be sole emperor of Rome. And the day before the battle, he has a startling vision. He looks up and he sees the sign of the cross. 
and he thought it was a promise from Jesus that he would win the battle. Constantine does win the battle, and the new emperor is forever changed by his vision. He decides he's going to be a Christian. One of his first official acts as the first Christian emperor of Rome is to issue the Edict of Milan. This not only makes Christianity legal, but favored. As Constantine moves Christianity from outlawed to exalted, church and state become intertwined. Constantine, by legalizing Christianity, opened up a space where the Bishop of Rome could become a permanent fixture on both the spiritual and the political scene. What Constantine did is take the bishops who had been previously persecuted and make them his agents. He treated them like members of his administration. So now he would take the Bishop of Egypt, the Bishop of Jerusalem, the Bishop of Athens, and state power would go through them. Bishops become important people in the local community. If people have disputes with each other, they are as likely to go to a bishop to get it sorted out. You had to go to him to get the food supply. That made him enormously wealthy and enormously influential. But almost as soon as Christians are free from Roman persecution, they begin fighting with each other. The biggest problem during this time was doctorate. In some people's eyes, Jesus was born of a woman. He can't be divine. And there's big questions about whether is Jesus a human? Is he divine? Is he both? You would think, wow, this is kind of hair-splitting doctrinal difference here. But, but there, you know, some people were willing to kill you for that, you see? So Christians willing to kill other Christians for those differences. To unite the empire, Constantine must gather his bishops under one church or risk having the Christian empire he's built come crashing down. He was angry and he said, look, these things you're quarreling about are just trivial. I stopped the persecutions. You should be grateful. So he called a council to unify the church. The Council of Nicaea is the first time you bring all of the bishops together and have them start to talk to each other. The Council marks the first meeting of senior church leaders, the foundation of the Pope's College of Cardinals today. The bishops were commissioned to write what a Christian should believe. Constantine manages to get the bishops to agree on one singular statement of faith, still used to unify Christians today, the Nicene Creed. The creed says, we believe in Jesus Christ, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And the council decides that Jesus is fully human and fully divine. Constantine declared, if you sign it, you're a Christian and you're part of us. And if you don't, you're excommunicated, you're out. You'll probably go to hell. So this became the battling cry for Catholics throughout the world. Rome is not a good place to live. It's very dangerous. The standard of living is very low. Rome was virtually gone. Church's center was in Constantinople. As Rome falls and Constantinople flourishes, much of the church's terminology becomes Greek instead of Latin. The Bishop of Rome begins to be referred to with the Greek word for father, papas, or pope. During this period of barbarian invasions, there is no centralized government left in Rome. The church is the only institution capable of addressing the needs of its suffering community. This is a time when the pope is not just the head of the church, he's also the ruler of Rome. The people of Rome were enormously dependent on the church as a state. So not as a church that oversaw the relationship between God and man, but as a church that oversaw food, water, safety. During an Easter procession, the Lombards viciously attack Pope Leo III. Their faction wrestles him to the ground and cut off his tongue, but he lives through it. 
Pope Leo III realizes that he needs protection, and with no army of his own, he must make an alliance. He chooses the most powerful king in the Western Empire, Charles the Great of France, better known as Charlemagne. On Christmas Day in the year 800, Pope Leo III calls Charlemagne to Rome, where he crowns him Holy Roman Emperor. Charlemagne took on himself the role of defender of the faith. The moment that Leo III crowns Charlemagne is really important because what it does, it puts the church back together with the empire. If you have the pope crowning a king, that means the pope is giving that earthly king temporal and divine power. Pope Leo III's decision to crown Charlemagne as Holy Roman Emperor marks the papacy's conscious pivot away from the Eastern Church. The relations between Rome and Eastern Christians had not been good for a while. Charlemagne, in his view, he was now the only legitimate Christian emperor left. As he grew in power, developed a very standoffish relationship with the ruler of Constantinople. And that really is the start of the schism between the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. In the two centuries after Charlemagne and Pope Leo III unite Western Europe under the papacy in Rome, the eastern part of the empire breaks off and begins to call itself the Greek Orthodox Church under the Patriarch in Constantinople. The word Catholic originally meant universal. Until the 11th century, there was just the one church. It wasn't until the church at Constantinople broke off from its allegiance to the Pope that we begin to see references to the Roman Catholic Church as no longer meaning universal, but meaning the church which is centered at Rome. Two hundred years after the historic alliance between Charlemagne and Pope Leo III, Pope Urban II rules the Western Empire from Rome, and the Patriarch reigns over the East from Constantinople, until Constantinople finds itself facing an imminent threat. Islam is the superpower of medieval period. They're the wealthiest, the most sophisticated. If I was betting at the time, I would have certainly bet that uh, Islam, that the Islamic empires were the wave of the future. Muslim armies have been steadily making their way through the Arabian Peninsula, conquering new lands and uniting them under Islam. Emperor Alexius I of Constantinople writes to Pope Urban II in Rome, pleading for aid against the Muslims. Alexios is asking a few hundred knights to help him defend his city. What he gets is something entirely different. Urban II is in part responding to an appeal from the Emperor Alexios. As the leader of the church, he's looking to improve the spiritual well-being of his people. But he's also a politician. Seeing an opportunity to unite Eastern and Western Christians and solidify his place as their leader, Pope Urban II calls an emergency gathering of clergy, knights, and townspeople. It was probably the most famous speech made during the Middle Ages. Urban told about the plight of Christians in the East who had had their lands conquered, horrible mutilations of nuns and clergy and pilgrims because of their faith. And what Urban did was very clever. Rather than just ask them to go and fight for the East, he also asked them to go all the way to Jerusalem to restore the lands that had been taken by Muslims. The response is amazing. People shout, Deus vult, God wills it. And this is the moment that crusading begins across Western Europe. Pope Urban was an example of a new kind of pope austere, powerful personality, the papacy as a self-consciously rallying, purifying, 
inspiring force, calling on people uh, to do something extraordinary for God. And it had enormous imaginative power. For the first time, the Pope, a religious leader, once at the mercy of barbarians and dependent upon kings for protection, raises an army and commands a war. When he calls for the First Crusade, Pope Urban II solidifies his role as a world power. The Pope is no longer just a spiritual guide, but a commander at the helm of an army. A zealous fleet of nearly 40,000 starts the long march east towards Jerusalem. The warriors begin their crusade through the Rhineland in what will become modern-day Germany. The destruction in the name of Christ is waged against all non-believers in their path. One of the terrible things that this group does is that they attack the Jews of the Rhineland. They decide that the Jews are the people who are responsible for the killing of Christ, and that if they are going to act against the enemies of the church, they will do so at home before they do so abroad. The Rhineland massacres are only the beginning of what will become a century of religious warfare at the command of the Pope. Now, if you're a Christian, you've likely heard of Protestantism and Catholicism and the great divide between the two. Well, this is how that came to be. Lena can read, understands the text, and can form her own opinion. To her, this is nothing special. But 500 years ago, that was not the case for many people. Back then, Germany and other parts of Europe were divided up quite differently, both politically and geographically. They were ruled by emperors, kings, princes, and the Roman Catholic Church. There was not yet a Protestant church at the time. These mainly told the people what to believe in and how they should live. The church had something, well, how should we put it? to offer sinful people. For example, they sold letters of indulgence. These were supposed to exonerate someone from sin and reduce or even completely avoid the time spent in purgatory, that is, the period before entering heaven, money in place of repentance. And indeed, they could be bought for deceased relatives too. The church used the money to finance the construction of St. Peter's Basilica, for example, and to plug up financial gaps. Not everyone agreed with this. A German theologian by the name of Martin Luther criticized this misuse of indulgence. According to traditions, he was said to have published 95 theses on that issue on October 31st, 1517. He listed reasons that things should be about belief alone, about repentance and God's grace, and not about making money and the church as an institution. How his theses were acknowledged is not known exactly today, but one thing is clear. Luther wrote history, and he heralded a reformation. Thanks to the newly developed book printing technology, Luther's writings spread quickly and he gained followers, which the church did not exactly like that much. It was a turbulent time for Luther. He was excluded, accused, and pursued. Away from the public eye, at the Wartburg Castle in the German town of Eisenach, he continued to write using the alias Knight George. It was there that he also translated the New Testament from Greek, Hebrew, and sometimes Latin into German. This is how he made it possible for many people to read the Bible and to think for themselves. Education and freedom were the most important topics of the Reformation. However, it was not only a religious matter. In his writings about the Reformation, Luther also addressed those who were dissatisfied with the political and social order, such as farmers who suffered due to taxes and serfdom. They now demanded justice from those who ruled over them. The institution of the Catholic Church was shaken by this, and a new Protestant Church was founded. Now right here are the key differences between that of Protestants and Catholics. Protestants, we believe sola scriptura, that is, strictly the word of God is what we go by. While the Catholics, they believe in scripture and tradition. We believe in grace alone. They believe in grace and human cooperation. 
We Protestants also only place our faith in Christ alone. While the Catholics, they believe in Christ and the Church. We believe that we are saved by grace through faith. They believe in faith and good works. Catholics even believe that an atheist can go to heaven if they have good works. Even Vatican II says that an atheist of goodwill can be saved. Because in following his conscience, if he does, John Henry Newman said the conscience is the aboriginal vicar of Christ in the soul. It's very interesting characterization, that it is, in fact, the voice of Christ. If he's the Logos made flesh, right, he's the divine mind or reason made flesh, that when I follow my conscience, I'm following him, whether I know it explicitly or not. So even the atheist, Vatican II teaches, of goodwill can be saved. And once again, the Catholics believe that the popes are the true successors of Simon Peter, and this is the reason why. Jesus, in Matthew 16, he saith unto his disciples, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He was the very first one among his disciples to openly proclaim him as the Messiah. And it's because of this that Simon Peter is granted this special honor. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now see, in the proper context, we see why Peter is given this rock, this foundational title for the church, because we know that the church is built upon a solid foundation. Now this is very important, especially for this study because that of the rock, but the chief cornerstone is that of Christ, and also the apostles and the prophets the church is built upon. But in essence, what Christ is implying here is that he wants all followers that are going to be built upon this foundation of Christ and the apostles and prophets, all of these followers that are going to make up the church of God, he wants them all to have the same confession as Simon Peter. Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what we all believe, and Simon Peter was the very first to say it. Jesus then continues telling Simon Peter, And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now he's speaking directly to Simon Peter. With thee, it's singular. So he's only speaking to Simon Peter, and he's saying, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, before I explain what is meant there, I'm going to tell you how Catholics take these verses out of context. Catholics assert that in giving Peter the keys of the kingdom, Christ not only made him leader, but also made him infallible when he acted or spoke as Christ's representative on earth, speaking from the seat of authority or ex cathedra. This ability to act on behalf of the church in an infallible way when speaking ex cathedra or from a seat of authority was passed on to Peter's successors thus giving the church an infallible guide on the earth. The purpose of the papacy is to lead the church unerringly, and they're claiming that the Pope has the very same authority, the very same keys to the kingdom. But this is so easy to explain, because in the book of Acts, we can see so clearly what Christ meant by this. As first in confessing Christ, Jameson Fawcett Brown commented on the verses in Matthew 16, as first in confessing Christ, thou art the Son of God, Peter got this commission before the rest. And with these keys to the kingdom on the day of Pentecost, he first opened the door of faith to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. Peter was the very first one to preach the gospel to the Jews. And then in the person of Cornelius, he was honored to do the same to the Gentiles. So Peter was the one in whom opened the door of the gospel to be preached to both Jews and Gentiles. So the keys of the kingdom authority that Jesus gave to Simon Peter, that was fulfilled then. No more need for it. But now let's examine this. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. To which Albert Barnes commented the phrase to bind and to loose was often used by the Jews. They would have known right away what was meant. It meant to prohibit and to permit. To bind a thing was to forbid it, and to loose it, to allow it to be done. Just for an example, thus they said about gathering wood on the Sabbath day, the school of the Shammai binds it, in essence, forbids it. The school of Hillel looses it, in essence, allows it. Jesus meant that whatsoever they forbade in the church should have divine authority. 
whatever they permitted or commanded should also have divine authority, that is, should be bound or loosed in heaven or meet the approbation of God. This does not refer to persons, but to things, whatsoever, not whosoever. It refers to rites and ceremonies in the church, in essence, those things commanded in New Testament writings referring to the church ordinances. But the Catholic hierarchy has taken such verses and used them to control people. John twenty twenty three is another example. When Jesus told his disciples, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now see, the Catholic hierarchy will look at their followers and say, Okay, if you don't obey the Catholic Church, you're excommunicated. But that was much more a statement of doctrine, as we do clearly see in the book of Acts once again. Adam Clark commented on the verse, It is certain God alone can forgive sins. The apostles received from the Lord the doctrine of reconciliation and the doctrine of condemnation. They who believed on the Son of God in consequence of their preaching, you preach the gospel just as we do today, those who believed on the Son of God in consequence of their preaching had their sins remitted, and they who would not believe were declared to lie under condemnation. And it's due to such distortion of verses that lead to that of the Catholic confessional and other traditions that they've held. If you've ever noticed a priest saying your sins are forgiven, once again, a clear distortion of the verse. Let's view it in the book of Acts, once again, on the day of Pentecost. What did Simon Peter preach? Did he say, all your sins are forgiven, because he was able to do that? No, that's not what he does. Acts 2.38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Notice, he says, if you repent and believe in Christ, then your sins are remitted. And it truly boggles the mind whenever you read like the catechisms and all of these, the statement of beliefs within the Catholic Church, how often they'll, they'll use the word anathema, like they'll curse you if you go outside of their ordinances. They'll usually refer to things like the First Vatican Council in 1870 instead of Scripture. The Catholic Church at the First Vatican Council in 1870 issued four anathemas, which means cursed, regarding heretical opinions regarding the Roman papacy, that of the popes. Therefore, if anyone says, according to the Catholic doctrine, therefore, if anyone says that blessed Peter the Apostle was not appointed by Christ the Lord as prince of all the apostles and visible head of the whole church militant, or that it was a Supremacy of honor only, and not one of true and proper jurisdiction that he directly and immediately received from our Lord Jesus Christ himself, let him be anathema. Now, basically what they're saying is that Simon Peter, from the very beginning, was made the head of all the church. And that's where Rome traces back this authority of the popes, how they are head of the whole church. But such was never the case with Simon Peter. He was never the head of the church. Once again, let's examine the authority that Jesus gave unto Simon Peter on that day. And I will give unto thee, Simon Peter, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now we know that that was fulfilled in the book of Acts. He went to the Jews, the first to preach the gospel to them on the day of Pentecost. And then he went to Cornelius. And then he was the first to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. So that was fulfilled then. And whatsoever thou, Simon Peter, shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So they say, okay, now look, Simon Peter had that authority over the rest. But just two chapters later, in Matthew 18, Jesus gives the very same authority to all of his disciples. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind, ye, that's plural, meaning all of you, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Once again, Albert Barnes commented on this matter. He employs them, Jesus employs them here to signify that they all had the same power, that in ordering the affairs of the church, he did not intend to give Peter any supremacy or any exclusive right to regulate it. And one can see this over and over again in the New Testament epistles. The teaching of Scripture, gotquestions.org commented, the teaching of Scripture taken in context nowhere declares that Simon Peter was in authority over the other apostles or over the church. Now that's very important to realize that Simon Peter never had such authority as the popes have, and they claim him to be the very first. 
Let's quickly review the second anathema, and let's just stop at this for the sake of time. If anyone says that, according to the Catholics, if anyone says that, it is not by the institution of Christ the Lord himself, that is to say by divine law, that the blessed Peter should have perpetual successors and the primacy over the whole church, or that the Roman pontiff is not the successor of blessed Peter in this primacy, let him be anathema. So they're saying that, the Pope's right to be the successor of Simon Peter is so ironclad within their belief system that anyone in whom rejects that is cursed. Now, this is a very crucial matter for this subject, my friends, because it's known as the apostolic succession. If Simon Peter did not mean to have any successors, then the position of the Pope is completely nullified. The difference between Roman Catholics and Protestants come down to the matter of apostolic succession. Rome claims that you can know its teaching is true because it possesses the apostolic succession of office. Its bishops follow one after another from the apostles, and the apostles promised apostolic succession in the office of the bishop to guarantee truth. And Protestants say, uh, we are right because we have the apostolic succession of teaching, not of office and that it is the apostle's teaching that guarantees the truth, not the apostolic office, and that the apostles never taught the apostolic succession of offices, but they did teach the apostolic succession of truth, which was to be preserved in the scriptures for us for all time. Nowhere does scripture state that in order to keep the church from error, the authority of the apostles was passed on to those they ordained, the idea behind apostolic succession. Apostolic succession is read into those verses that the Roman Catholic Church uses to support this doctrine. Now, for a closing note, I would like to remind all of you that the position of Pope is completely unbiblical. We are not to look to a certain man to be the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. Paul the Apostle himself was willing to cast aside all the apostles in order for the doctrine, the gospel itself, to remain whenever he wrote to the Galatians. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so Paul preached this, probably his whole ministry, stick to the gospel, stick to the scripture. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And we can all think of the plethora of heresies that have been conjured up by the Catholic Church. If you just know your Bible, you know these things. And the Council of Florence in 1441 stated that the most holy Roman church firmly believes, professes, and preaches that none of those existing outside the Catholic Church can have a share in eternal life. Pope Pius IX in his encyclical letter in 1863 said that, and I quote, well known is the Catholic teaching that no one can be saved outside the Catholic Church. Just as Paul told the Corinthians how Christ is not divided, his majesty will not be given to any other. Was Paul crucified for you? Was the Pope crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul or the Pope? For there is one God, one Holy Father, and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, one head of the church, the man Christ Jesus, not the Pope.